Hi and welcome to CSN Tech. I'm Peter Briggs and this is part two of my video with uh, General Bashel. Um, so, and we we're going to go further into his understanding of leadership today. So the army's culture, um, I, I loved my time in the armed forces. Yeah. Uh, I, I enjoyed the culture, um, but it's not the culture that we had when I first joined. Um, and it is definitely evolving, but is it evolving enough? Because um, civilian culture is, um, is, I think, is fractured in different yeah. types of culture. And are we really um, giving ourselves, as the armed forces, the opportunity to take those extra cultures that are in our British culture and in, subsume them into our culture in the army? Because some of them do seem to be at odds with each yes. other. So, I, I mean, I used to say, to young people as I left the army, that the army is better than the one I joined in 1984. And it's primarily better because we treat people better. And I would say to you that in my time, I've seen vast improvements in the way we tolerate different differences in, in ourselves between others, and particularly racism and sexism, uh, and our acceptance of LGBT, in the military, the fact that women can now join every part of our army, the, uh, the focus on health, the reduction in alcohol. I think drugs remains a challenge, I, I, but that's a slightly separate. And the general behavior of our people, I, I, I would judge was, is much improved. As a culture, the culture of the military, it's got, and I think the other aspect we used to talk about is the investment we put into education. You know, we give young people who haven't got a maths or an English GCSE, we give them the equipment, we invest in them as individuals. Um, and investing in people started almost, I mean, I think almost 25 years ago as, as, a, as a thematic. And everyone had a little book that they used to carry around, you remember, a little file? Do you know, and that to me is all emblematic of positive change in culture. I think also we should be very proud of our stands and values, particularly our values. They stand for an awful lot. And if you live by those, and you generally live by them, you are a very good person, a very good human being. And so much of the culture in the military, I believe is very, very good, very good. But there are ways, and we do, you just talked about it there yourself just now, there are ways in which we could get better by importing thoughts and ideas, particularly in the HR area arena from civilian businesses who have proven great success. And I think, you know, I talk about you know, the military, I've talked about already, the hierarchy is designed around on mission. But off mission, in barracks, we are, we are, we are, we are at our weakest rather than our, str our strongest. And I, I think there are, there are um, coaching ideas, there are training ideas, there are developmental ideas, which we could look at other companies. And I think we have to a degree, and we can pull them in and improve our culture as a consequence. But I, but I, you know, I, I, I would, I would always be pretty defensive about the army's culture. I think we have actually got a very good culture, uh, largely by and large. But of course, we recruit from society. And if a, a man or woman comes into our army, who has been brought up in a in a household with strong racist prejudice, then it takes quite a long time to wash some of that prejudice out, and to really believe in respect for others and treating everyone equal or equally. So I, I, I think that's, a, that's always gonna be a challenge, but the culture is a positive one. And I see those of us who've left, as I've said, the veteran community have much to offer the civilian world uh, following a service, a period of service in, in our army. Fantastic. I, I, I liked what you said there about the values and standards. I, I use values and standards a lot in my good. teaching um, because and I, I had a really good session on Mat 6, uh, probably about three years before I left the army. And not many people could say that about Mat 6. But uh, it, it was um, that um, anybody can have standards. Thieves yeah. had standards. Yeah. Um, robbers have standards. Drug dealers have standards. But it's the yeah. value that yeah. elevates yeah. the military to beyond the, the norm, beyond the, the yeah. exceptional. I, I like I think, that, and that was so. Uh, and I do, I think, and that was codified in our army in around 2000, 2002. Um, so that again is a positive change that's happened in my time. Um, and and I, I, I think 
of course, people have to learn it by rote to start with, but then they start to really reflect and think about it. Fantastic. Um, can we just talk about your leadership um, oh. role models? So uh, who, who are your leadership role models um, and, um, and who's had the greatest influence upon your development? Well, I, I, I would come back, first of all, to say, I think my reading is, is probably what's shaped me the most in terms of my learning and my thinking about military leadership. And, and I loved, you know, I've always loved, admired Napoleon. Uh, I've always admired Rommel. Uh, you know, and these are military sort of obviously very military people and and their styles um, and and I, th I think you try to carry through some of that thinking into into your own into your own um, ways of developing and and as you come up to a certain appointment you think through and you read I mean I've I always remember reading Norman Schwarzkopf's book before I became a battalion commander that I thought was a fantastic book uh, and you you just pick up particularly when they talk about the values aspects of what they do and, and the things they focused on and how they came to think the way they did. But then in my service, I think I've probably served with two people who probably shaped me more than anything else, and anyone else. And, and the first of them was um, another retired Lieutenant General called Sir Hugh Pike, who commanded three power in the Falklands War, and for whom I was his military assistant for 18 months. Uh, at a time, a very pivotal time in my life really, because I hadn't yet been a company commander I hadn't really had a proper leadership role beyond being a platoon commander. And he was an inspiration to me in terms of his energy, his understanding, his thinking, his creativity, the way he used the examples that he'd learned from his time in, in particularly in the Falklands War and, and um, had codified them and thought through them. And then, you know, the way he looked after people, the way he treated, he did his, he did his um, OGR writing, the thought and care he put into stuff and his excellent judgment on people and and all matters so that was a great learning and then the second one was my was my commanding officer when i then went back to the battalion uh a, a, another retired general called jonathan shaw who had actually been my adjutant in three para and then he was my commanding officer in two para and then actually i served under him in basra again when he was a general and i was a brigadier so we, we sort of we had to spend a lot of time but particularly those two years two and a bit years when he was my commanding officer and the thing about Jonathan, which I took most from, is that he was a very much a people-centric leader. And although he'd served with special forces and he'd served in the Falklands and he'd done everything you can imagine you, you need to do, he actually used to spend so much time talking to us about how we lead and create teams. And I, I learned a huge amount from him um, at that time. And I hoped I tried to carry forward some of his his ways actually into, into my own times as CEO. And I think beyond that, I was just thinking about this because I think the other person who is more recently, much more recently now, and you won't know this, this individual, but his name's Tim Gibson. And he's, he's sort of, he's my boss at, at Fujitsu. And as I've left the military and come into the civilian environment, I've actually learned a huge amount from Tim about how to lead in a civilian or in a, in a, in a so that I say that, Perhaps the best way to put it is a non-hierarchical environment. And how he generates trust and teamwork and spirit and motivation. And I mean, I would say that our away days, for example, are much more productive because there is no hierarchy. So everyone's on first name terms. There's no, you know, there's none of this sort of military stuff. So everyone's very honest and, and straightforward about what they say. But he does create, and he has created, I've seen it, a very, very strong culture of positivity in the place where we work. And, and more than that, he's very successful. And it's just been interesting to me to see a different way of working when you're not in this you know, classic military environment. So, um, and I've actually taken quite a lot from, because it's all current at the moment, it's all sort of going on, and I'm thinking about it a lot more than I did perhaps you know, 20 years ago. Fantastic. That's good to hear as well. Um, mm. The uh, the army's recruiting at the moment on um, a advertisement campaign where you uh, failure within a uh, controlled environment. Mm. Um, is there an example of you 
that you I thought I I I looked at those those adverts and I wasn't quite sure really because I think the challenge you have is that you don't have the time to go and repeat and get better. So yes, of course I've learned, you know, and I think particularly, I mean, Norman Schwarzkopf, who I mentioned his book, he talks, he talked about four things he was going to do. And, and one of which was always stuck with me in my mind was look after his families. And I felt as a CEO, I didn't look after the families enough. I didn't focus enough on the families. We were way too much. I was too busy uh, and, 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 but I can't go back and repeat that. I can, I can try and perhaps be a better brigade commander, but then it's more diff difficult when you're that further away from it to look after families. I, I think of a Tezex we did where we tried out a tactic which worked, but it was experimentation. And we never got the, ch well, it worked, but it didn't work. And I would have refined it and done it better if I could have gone back and done it again, but I never got the chance to do it again. So I do agree with the premise that you learn from, from mistakes and we all make mistakes and so we should all learn. And you know, the cardinal rule is never to repeat the same thing once you've got it wrong once. But I'm not sure we have enough time in the military to really have a, a, a chance, unless you are on Pacific mission training and you really, really can go around and again and again until you get it right. Uh, and I think probably I, I, I didn't, I reflected on failure, but I didn't learn a lot, lot from it necessarily. Fantastic. That's good. Well, that's not me. I, mean, I think, as I said, everyone makes mistakes, you know, and I've made loads, but I'm, I'm saying I never, I, yeah. I think um, uh, from my own perspective, when watching those adverts, it's, it's minor mistakes. I think that's what yeah. they're, they're sort of yeah. suggesting, isn't it? Because uh, I think if you made a mistake in operational tour, yeah, you, you, there's, there's no coming back from that, is there? That's, yeah. that's no, exactly. Like, I mean, if you're practicing room entry and you've got, you know, laser vests that you know you've hit or haven't, you, know, you, you could do it again and again and again until you really get it right. Now that's a sort of, that's a different level. You say that's a tactical level, which is very different mm. from what I think, you know, I, for me, that's, you know, of course we, you know, that, that, uh, you, you're asking me the question about. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that practice there is more like teacup, isn't it? The um, Clive yeah. yes. theory on, on practice. That's, that's, uh, oh, Clive, Clive Woodbridge uses that, doesn't he, in rugby? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, do you think as we move forward and the army is becoming smaller, we're relying more on drones and, and um, computer systems to control um, elements of our armed forces, do you think leadership will still be a constant or do you think it's going to evolve and how is it going to evolve with these changes to yeah. um, technology? So I absolutely think leadership is going to be a constant. I absolutely think a lot of success and failure will be defined by leadership, but it'll be different. And it may be that it is the leadership in the organization before you deploy and having the, the good sense to buy these drones that you talk about and invest in new technology that's going to define uh, success more than necessarily the, the sort of the on mission hand to hand combat, which we might have sort of thought about in the past. So, of course, the, you know, as we say, I, I believe the nature of war will not change. And again, that talks about the profound need for leadership particularly when you take casualties and you're dealing with grief or you're dealing with some very unpleasant aspects on the battle, battlefield. But the character is changing and the position of the commander, uh, and, and there's, there's always debates about this. Do you know, I mean, there's, there's apocryphal tales, in fact, they're probably truthful about Lyndon Johnson, who was, the, sec who was the, prime, sorry, the president of America during the Vietnam War, would sit in the White House and personally pick targets. Uh, and of course, there's a danger with a, with a technology that allows information to go all the way to the very top from the bottom, that the prime minister or the chief of defense staff can have an overview of the battle space, which is greater than someone who's even you know, physically closer to it. So there's, there's not, and that, that discussion is, is always ongoing. Um, so there will be questions about the position of the commander and how best to filter all this information you've now got, the so-called blizzard of information that you can get from all these data sources. But fundamentally, success or failure will still have a large chunk of leadership you know, involved. And you can look, I think, at anything, almost anything, whether you look at the pandemic at the moment with our own government, you know, the leaders are held to account and are accountable. And I sense that that will always be thus. It will just be a different style and perhaps a different way of leadership in the future. 
what you were just saying there about the uh, the you know the pathway to information to the highest levels that's yeah. that's a very long handled screwdriver isn't it yes. we used to talk yeah. about the long handled screwdriver and that's but that's it, because, it, you that, because technology allows you mm -hmm. to sit in london and turn on your screen and you can watch the same kill footage that the person in Basra is watching Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I mean, you, you look at that imagery of um, when the Americans killed bin Laden and you've got the, the, the president sat around with all just watching it on screen. Yeah. Now, I know he wasn't, I mean, because he talks about it in his book, he wasn't, he didn't want to interfere. He, he sort of wasn't sure he wanted to do it and go and watch it. But it was so pivotal because he'd, he'd actually authorized it. And therefore, those men's lives were in his hands and he wanted to see what was happening. So, yes, there's a danger you can get sucked into tactical business that's not yours because of it last question sir um is is about uh, altruism and leadership um mm -hmm. so can true altruism and mm -hmm. the drive to be the best to be the highest um and the um the the real highest pinnacle leader can they work in conjunction with each other is are these skills that can be uh, cross-pollinated really yeah, I and mean, I guess an interesting question. I think we would all like to think we're altruistic and our motives are absolutely pure. And I certainly felt when I left Sandhurst and we lived by that, you know, the, the code, which is all on a cat badge, serve to lead. I was given a little red book, serve to lead with some great quotes, which I, I've used all my military career, actually, parts of those. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, a lot of what Sandhurst gives you in your DNA when you leave is that service. It's about service. It's not about you, it's about others, which is very powerful when you think about it. And particularly in, in contrast, perhaps, to some of the views that, that I've, I've found in civilian world. It, it is that, that, that ideal, it's, it's almost religious to a degree, that idea of service. I think it's very strong. Uh, and, and as you go through your, your military career, I would always like to think that you care about the people that you lead and you do the right thing for them and your motives are pure that you're you're but there is always in all of us a mix of of, of sort of good and bad and there is that sort of you know, i think where it goes wrong and i think where, where your question is getting at is when you have too much ambition when you're overly ambitious and and it's transparent that your motives are about going up up and up and up in terms of rank rather than service to others and that is something that i think is is it's very preventable um, but there is uh, but i think there's also for all leaders there is there is a a little bit about this which which is not a pleasant thing necessarily to think about but there is a bit of being a bit of a chameleon do you know you have to you have to particularly in senior ranks you have to be general bashful to the prime minister and a minister and you know and then you have to turn around and be general bashful to one RMP battalion, or whatever, you know, and 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 you you are going to talk and 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 be and 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 say different things and and be slightly and there is also a time, however much you think people are good people, you know, good leaders, all of us at times need to be ruthless, and perhaps cunning, and at times nasty if we are to succeed, and so there is a little bit of mixture of, of everyone of everything, but, but but fundamentally, I would love to believe that. We're led by good altruistic people who've got all the motives right and I, and I do believe actually that in the military in the army in particular a, a vast majority there were very few who i ever wrote ojars on which would basically say that this person should go no further because they're so flawed i, I don't think i ever wrote a report like that um so yes i think it is possible probably the answer to your question I have a bit of both but i think um i think that that is the norm Thank you very much, sir. Is there anything you'd like to add before we uh, conclude? No, I, well, well, thank you for inviting me. I, I hope what I've said may be of use. Um, I, I, I consider myself extremely fortunate to have held the ranks I've had, to held the appointments I've had. And I'm always keen to try and help young people and to help people develop. Because I, I said, I, I tend to see the positives in everybody and believe in the positives in everybody. And sometimes it just takes people like yourself perhaps with the coaching you're doing just to draw it out but no it's been good to see you again and, and good thank to chat much, about, about a part of my life which means a huge amount to me still brilliant thank you very much for your time sir very much appreciated you're most welcome thank you